All right. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to get it switched over to my desktop and bring up the feedback. Here we go. Um, hi, and welcome to our last target discussion for 2013. We're going to be taking a break in December, um, getting back into the swing of things in January. Maybe that changes up just a little bit with some exercises as well as uh, just discussing targets. So that way you get a chance to practice some of your tools in a purposeful way instead of random. So anyway, we have a good crowd here. We have several sessions to go over. Lynn's with us. Uh, he's not feeling his best. He's got an upper respiratory thing going and he's sounding a little rough. So hopefully uh, he'll be able to, we won't push him too far, but hopefully he'll be able to join in and share all those pearls that are so much a part of his natural everyday life. So thanks everybody for being here. Um, our target this week is the Glade Creek Grist Mill in Babcock State Park, West Virginia. This was taken in 2009 by someone I know, this image. Uh, you can, because I need to spend some time uh, up close and personal with my guy who does my computer uh, stiffing up for me. Um, I have adware that's popping up and I think that's what made it lock up last week or two weeks ago. So I'm um, not going to be rolling around doing any kind of net searching for feedback, but this is easily researched any place that you want to punch in this Babcock State Park. And then it has a rich history with several grist mills. This one is still functional. There's a large pool of water right in front of it. Um, and the history is that it was completed in 1976. It's fully operational and it's a recreation of one with ground grain on Glade Creek long before Babcock became a state park. It was known then as Cooper's Mill. It stood on the present location of the Parks Administration Building parking lot. Um, actually known as Cooper's Mill, I was wondering if we might get some impressions related to coopering. Cooping? Um, anyway, that's a trade. And so I haven't had a chance to look at these sessions, barely skimming them. Uh, of special interest, the mill is created by combine, combining parts and pieces from three mills which once dotted the state. Basic structure of the mill came from Stony Creek Grist Mill, which dates back to 1890. It was dismantled and moved piece by piece to Babcock and near Campbell Town in Pocahontas County. After an accidental fire destroyed the spring run grist mill near Petersburg, Grant County, only the overshot water wheel could be salvaged. Other parts from the mill came from Onego Grist Mill near Seneca Rocks in Pendleton County. So there's an awful lot of potential, I thought, in this target with all this pieces and parting and the feedback and the rich history. Um, if anybody would move to a different area, it would be hard to track that down. But I thought it would be a good practice for all of you to stay on target at this target. A living monument to the over 500 mills which thrived in West Virginia at the turn of the century the Blade Creek Grist Mill provides freshly, freshly ground cornmeal, which park guests may purchase depending on availability and stream conditions. Visitors to the mill may journey back to the time when grinding grain by a rushing stream was a way of life, and the groaning mill wheel was music to the miller's ear. And here's the one interior shot that I could find. And Lynn has a target on in his many, in his target pool, um, that we actually researched once, I think, the interior, and we were able to find more at that time on how it actually sounded and functioned and what activity happened in there. Actually, that was a windmill in Holland. Um, and this was actually in the 1930s, two CCC camps were loaded, located here close by. I'm not going to read this word for word. And an old mining town bordered the park and the park in. And they're located at the former site of Camp Lee. 
and there's all the things that go along with that barracks and kitchens and ambulances and such so if you didn't land at the grist mill in time and space maybe if you were attracted to other things maybe these perceptions might be showing up and so i thought that's an lynn and i were talking about this this week about different types of targets that we're putting up and we can't predict what was at a site we know what's there now you know what was there 100 years before and 100 years before that and 500 years before that so there's all kinds of potential and that's one of the reasons that we're practicing and doing our sessions is to stay steady in time and space and view the target at the time that the feedback image is taken not the image but at the time i hear somebody's mic is that you lynn i need to bring that up not me okay um so here it is it's there's some significant talk here about what the guys did when they got up and made this camp uh the boys got up in the morning had revelry stood while they raised the flag and marched to the mess hall where they had breakfast and then they were taken over to the park and then they did the reverse of that after working all day after winter time it was too cold to work sometimes and so they didn't come to the park to work but they still have to get up and march in the morning there was education and they're calling the boys but they're actually men so it was actually there's if anybody got vocational there is that there's teaching at the grist mill about what it does so that's a learning educational opportunity as well as this was an educational opportunity for the guys who helped build it at the ccc so it's turned out a lot of good uh craftsmen and artisan from this experience uh good stonemasons good carpenters and draftsmen or engineers and they load up every two or three weeks and go to the movies and they own the shows only cost uh 25 cents so there's a fair amount of engineers and architects and in and draftsmen around and then there are other buildings around administration cabin and the department of the interior is involved and there's a stone, the supervised park stone quarry, and there, an Italian, oh, I think somebody might have gotten Italian, I think it's Michelle, um, and she's not here. He, like four or five other stone masons hired at the time, was an Italian from Fayetteville. They built a dam in front of the building, uh, administration building created a public swimming pool. And I don't see that that's actually part of the mill. So that's probably down the way. Now, in the, the links down here, I do have included a short video of the mill. It's only maybe half a minute. So you can see what it actually looks like when it's working. And the photo is courtesy of Wallace Goose Marshall. I know him. And there's the link that talks about where I have the feedback and the interior shot and so that is all of the feedback with the history let me grab a session let me move this over okay here's ron let me see if i can kind of minimize this a little bit I should have his stuff on the left and feedback on the right to be able to see his session better. All right, so he did not have any previews of coming attractions. This is only a five page session. He's got great structure going down through his um, phase one. Um, Mojo's really trying to um, learn structure, he's making leaps and bounds changes already. So we're taking Mojo, he's, Ron has taken the coordinates probably three to five times and made his ideograms and then he's going down through his IAD sequence and describing the ideogram, then the feel of the ideogram and then going on to label the ideogram. And he's got man-made, natural, land, and an unknown. 
up oh, and liquid. Then he goes into phase two and he's working them one at a time in a controlled fashion. There's a little sketch popping through the straight cat of foot. And he's getting just a few perceptions of each thing. Not really seeing any dimensionals yet. Much. But he's got, I don't see an AI that's declared. He's had one someplace. Where he's in phase three illegally, I'll put it that way. So from the looks of that sketch, I would be saying he's probably had one someplace. And um, Ron, when we finish, when I, uh, or any time, if you want to talk, I was curious to know what an island within an island meant. Because when you cue yourself with purpose after phase three, that, that's more of a concept like what is done at this site and what's the purpose of this target. You know, like recreational, educational, work-related. So you've got an island within an island, and I was going to ask you what that meant to you. Do kind of a little impromptu P5. Okay, can you hear so, me? I can hear you. Hi. Okay. So after I was all done and looked at it, I got the feeling that uh, maybe there was an island somewhere, and this was an island within an island. Mm-hmm. So you wrote that on there after? Yeah. No, not after I was done, but as I was doing it. Okay. I wrote an island an island. Didn't make any sense to me at the time. Okay. Um, that's not really, unless, you know, Lynn wants to put a different spin on it. That's not what I'm looking for. That's more of kind of a note. Um, it doesn't give me a purpose, I'll put it that way. No. But Besides that, it's, it's an attempt to... Describe, identify. Describe, yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, identify the target. Yeah. But I, I can see where you're kind of going with it. I think. And then Ron's just now starting with intermediate, so he's got a little bit of stuff here in a in a phase four matrix, and then he wrapped it up. And his summary says, uh, I was pretty impressed actually with, with this summary. Um, target has man-made natural land and unknown and liquid. The man-made seems hard to the right, to the right of me and across the bay. So there's that AI that didn't get declared up in the session. The water is reflecting the, the sun, making the bay blue, white, and shiny. The natural, you guys can't see the bay in the picture. Well, you can see this little pool right in front. I'm pointing it like y'all can see. Um, but there is up in, up by the paddle wheel too. Um, the natural appears to be rolling hills that are green rolling down to the bay. Land goes into the bay. Again, there are white caps on the blue water. The land seems hard with volcanic rocks present. There are sandy areas that are black. There is a feeling of Greek and Roman influence. The island feels loose and soft. The dampness makes the ground slippery, making it more exciting. The round, small structure on the island is ancient and visited by many. Liquid is served as refreshment, some bottled water and soda, but mostly German or Bavarian ale. The water surrounding the island seems salty, but the lake seems fresh. Okay. Mo, oh, I'm sorry. Not Mojo, sorry, his name's up, so I popped that right out of my mouth. Ron, did you have anything you wanted to talk about with this session? And Lynn, yeah, I'm not going to push you to talk with that voice of yours, so you do what you want to do, okay? Well, that's okay. I do have something to say about this, but let's let Ron go first. Okay. okay. Yeah, I think I need to be describing it better with the uh, uh, my perceptions. It seems like it just... I don't know. It seemed like there was perceptions there, but I weren't getting them as many as I should have. 
Well, you were a little skimpy compared to your usual, but I don't know why. I mean, you're the viewer and you're in charge of the session. That's the prime directive. And right up there with describe, don't identify. Um, I usually... If you yeah. have trouble with a session and you have a bad session and don't get anything, that puts you right down there with the rest of us, okay? <laughs> don't feel bad about it. <laughs> no, I thought okay. I had some, something to do with uh, now that I'm going into intermediate and I go into my uh, phase four, I'm thinking too hard about it instead of just doing it. I'm trying to get everything in the right column. Yeah. Uh, Teresa, if you would scroll back to the summary. Okay. One of the things uh, that will let you ease your way out of um, um, nouns and trying to identify things, uh, there is a rule in controlled remote viewing that says that if you have an ideogram for something, you can use it. And so look at this. The target has man-made natural land unknown and liquid. Okay, the man-made seems hard to the right of me and across the water. The water is reflecting the sun, making the water blue um, and shiny. The natural appears to be rolling land that uh, is green rolling down to the water. And so you have ideograms for water and land and all this, and you can ease yourself out of the temptation to um, to identify things by simply going back to those uh, gestalts, those nouns that you do have ideograms for. And, uh, and it'll also keep you from trying to identify the target and, and messing up in the process of doing it. So um, uh, there are many other reasons for uh, the fact that you can use any noun that you have an, an ideogram for. But uh, if you use it in that way, especially when you're writing your summary, it will, um, it will help you get away from trying to identify the target. So uh, hopefully that will help a little. Um, the article that Ron and I just wrote together for Eight Marta Martinis at CRV Newbie, um, at a ground report, you know, he felt so good because he finally felt like he had made great sight contact and had identified the target. And he, you know, had studied on his own before he came to study with us. And so that's always been something that he's, I won't say fought, but just describing and not trying to name the target, you know, and when he did that session with the Canada session, you know, it was when he had the aha moment and realized he wasn't describing the photograph. He was describing the site. So, yeah, he is, has, um, it's been it's ingrained article, in him. Mm -hmm. It's a very good article, by the way. Oh, thank you, Ron. It was a very good article, the man said. No, I think uh, you and Lynn, because you're the ones that uh, got me motivated to do it. Uh, we just kibitz. You learned it on your own. Yep, you did. And because, and I said it right out, because you shared that, that session, it gave all of us a chance to talk about it and learn a lot of things. If we don't have this kind of feedback as a group, you know, it, we grow so slowly. This really is like putting a lighter to rocket fuel. It might not seem like it. And what Lynn just told you about taking your nouns out like bay and hills and using water instead and land instead of those nouns, you know, it's now you're going to think, uh, oh, now I have to go back and I'm going to have to remember that. And, you know, there are some people that take six pages of notes on that. Your subconscious is going to remember. And so eventually, you know, it'll all come together. But you still had a really good session here. It is abbreviated for you. But don't call yourself up short because, look, you, you have that you – it was across the bay. I mean, you de are describing this area with the rocks and the water yeah. that's moving and the hills that are rolling. 
and the structure. And so I, when I read this um, summary, I was nothing but smiles. Uh, and, you know, look at the thing from the viewpoint of the camera. Uh -huh. The handmaid is across the water. Yes. Uh, the rolling land and and so forth. Um, yeah, you know, it's it's the nouns that always get you. Uh, you just that's your worst enemy these days, you know, as a remote viewer. Well, now, you, now you got me worried about something. <laughs> Go ahead. Did I make sight contact, or was I looking at the picture? Well, I think you made sight contact. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah, and nice. even even your sketch up there of the island within the island, the vantage point of that shows that you're not viewing the target. You're viewing, I mean, you're not viewing the um, picture. Photo. Yeah. If you were, you'd be viewing it at a different angle. Okay. Nice so, work. Yeah, yeah, you made sight contact on that. That's, that's definite. I'll just, I'll just keep working hard at it. And Try to get it down so I can get you more pages. Well, that's what I keep trying to. <laughs> it's hey, you're the coming. you're the viewer. And you're in charge of your sight, and so you know sometimes you just it's you do what feels right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I always encourage everybody. Uh, I mean, you can work the same target for the rest of your life if you want to. I personally think you'll learn a little more if you don't uh, if you you know turn in more than one in your lifetime. So you know because mm -hmm. you are practicing, so you can learn. Right. But anyway. Okay. Thank you. That was a good session. Okay. Thank you, and Lynn. Our pleasure. All right. Let's see what we got here. Michael. Let's see. We've got. Let me see if I can make this a little smaller. Kind of the wrong kind of small. Summary should be at the beginning of it. All right. The very, very beginning of it? Yeah. There we go. All right. Um, target has elements of man-made. Man-made has elements of upward arch and curved spiral-like pattern, which is black in color. Rough sandpaper-like texture with smooth sections, cold temp. Wider at the base than at the top, helix-like pattern, complex, ornate, spiral-like pattern inside a larger structure. The larger structure has elements of tall, gray-green color, tower-like, curved at the bottom. Open plaza-like space in front of the structure. The open space has many bios in it, arm-like structures at the top. End of the arm-like structures are, structure is, are fuzzy to me, meaning I can't define what they are. Bios, crowd-like noise, the structure has a nostalgic feel, and its purpose is to show off, display, or view. It had AOLs of statues, Statue of Liberty, and Christ's Redeemer statue in Rio, Rio de Janeiro. And so, summary at the front, which is actually, I don't push that. That is what's supposed to happen, technically. I'm scrolling down through here to see what your sketches are looking like, especially since we don't have a lot of the internal working. Um, some some grist mills, you've got some really definitive stones and uh, uh, how the arm turns and stuff like that. I'm sorry, I didn't want to throw in other grist mills if I couldn't tell for sure that they were this one, because then I'd have you possibly jump in target and location. So um, we've got wider, oops, wrong one. Wider at that's not the base, I don't think. That word. Yeah. So cool temp and something is arching above you. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, that's fine. And that black, is this black right here? Yeah, black. Okay. Spiral light. Um, Mechanical. And complex, okay. And almost all, 
in almost all grist mills, there is a um, heavy wheel that uh, will crush the the seeds and all that. Mm -hmm. But then when it crushes the seeds, it pushes stuff to the side. And so almost every grist mill on the inside of it is going to have uh, oh, this is trivia. I, I can't think of what they call it. But anyway, it's a, it's a sort of a wall that winds around and scoops the, um, the stuff that's been pushed out to the side back under the wheel. And so, um, and usually that's in an arch, arch, arch type shape. Hmm. All right, we're learning. And complex, large, ornate. Ornate. Cool. Sorry, my spelling was bad on this one. All right. Welcome to the club. <laughs> Typical viewer. So we've got ornate and power light. We got large something at the bottom. Uh, sound bios. Bio uh -huh. Yep. Now look at this sketch right here. Our, we've got arm light up the top, and then this. Mm -hmm. And then move a hundred feet above it and describe. So you gave yourself a nice move command there. Fuzzy at the end. Yeah, I couldn't quite figure out what was going on like at the end of those arms. I just And you got like fuzzy on that way. <laughs> yep, and search circular and do you have any idea what that? Then you're getting amphitheater AOL. The light or opening. Uh huh. Okay, that is what. Push my head around here. Hmm. Are we done? I guess we are. Yeah, that was it. I'm sorry. Blank page. No, it's okay. Well, so what did you think? Good, bad? Um. Well, if that if that sketch is that whatever that thing is, the feedback. I mean, I've been having a problem with uh, scale and mm -hmm. where I'm where I'm starting out the target. Because I'm even in some of the other practice sessions I've done, I seem to end up starting at the target dead center and really really small. And I can't seem to, like, if that drawing is that feedback photo, to me, that was, like, 100 feet high in my perception of it. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to figure out is how to orient myself correctly. Would using the um, graphic arts program help you with that I wonder I don't know but I know when you did that one of the uh, uh, Temple of the Rock yeah uh, I mean you had on that you were you were using that 3D graphics program and I mean it so it's like that, one, it. that one I seem to have a scale correct I did a target last week it was practice session from the 10,000 Roads website, and it was of a uh, it was of a ship anchor just sitting on the ground. And, but to me, like it felt like 100 feet across and you know 50 feet tall or something. And one of the things I I, I thought about doing was I gave myself a move command, move back to an appropriate distance and scale to see the target, and describe. That's the perfect way to get rid of the, um, it's called the, um, God, I just went blank. Uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Sorry. That's okay. 
It's right. called the orientation problem. Yeah. Yeah. And the uh, way to get away from the orientation problem is to give yourself a move for that. And uh, for those who don't know what it is, you may wind up at the target the size of an ant looking and, you know, the target's a cup of coffee and you see it as a humongous uh, oil thing or something like that because it's so big. Or you may wind up at the site, you know, 40 feet tall and that same cup of coffee looks like a, a thimble or something. And uh, you may wind up at the target on your side or upside down. And um, these things happen to all viewers sooner or later. Uh, and so a lot of people, once they get sight contact, like even early in phase two, they'll just give themselves a move command. And like Michael said, uh, you know, move back an appropriate amount or even move an appropriate amount and describe. And uh, that will generally cure any of the uh, orientation problems. So you d you done good. Can can you give a move command like move to one to one scale or move to human scale? And sure. describe? Your subconscious mind is very smart, okay. and uh, and whatever agreement you make with it, and whatever understanding you have with it, then all you have to do is just uh, you know go with that. And yeah, you can give all kinds of commands like that. Okay. Uh, you can even, uh, I know we had some uh, uh, targets where there were some, uh, these were targets in, in the Caribbean and South America and all that where protection was put on them by um, whoever. But anyway, uh, we just said, you know, uh, move to the move to what you would see if there weren't protection and the viewer would be off and running. It's like if you could describe it, what would you see? Yeah. Um, speaking of site orientation, I was noticing with Ron um, and you said he was viewing the site and not the feedback photo because he came in at a different angle. I'm seeing that from him at least this session, and I don't, it almost looks as if he comes in on the left side of it. I don't know if he's seen enough of his work. So, uh, but uh, people will tend to uh, do that. I always, I always come in with the target on my right. So almost every time I do a session, uh, once I get the site contact, I say turn to the right a little bit and describe and. I'm back on target. Uh, everybody has their own little quirks and crazies. <laughs> we all have them. <laughs> I wanted you to bring that up since we were talking about site orientation. So, Ron, you might want to pay attention. You're not doing anything wrong. I'm just saying that you'll notice that you do it. And so if everything, when you do, um, I, we did the target with the power station over in Spain and you drew the circle and it had the road in it and the two round structures. And I'm thinking that kind of the cluster of buildings was a little bit up and to the right, like toward the one o'clock position or something. So I'm sort of thinking that you might, when you're in a more advanced stage of your learning, um, that might be something that you might want to pay attention to. So that you know, and then you can do something to change or, or turn or whatever, like Lynn learned. So it, like I said, you're not doing anything wrong or bad. It's just something that you do. And that's the reason to do a session is not to learn something about the target. It's to learn something about yourself. That's right. And like I say, all viewers have these little quirks and, you know, it just comes from being one of those humans. <laughs> okay. Can't get away from it. Anything else you wanted to bring up, Michael? No, that was it. That was mostly the scale problem. Well, thanks for um, contributing because uh, as an advanced viewer, it's great for these guys. Uh, they don't exactly know 
everything that you're talking about, but they're being exposed. And so they're coming along pretty fast because of all this sharing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this is a good target. I mean, this is a good session, too. That makes a good painting, actually. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and actually, um, when you research this, this is a very famous photograph, and this almost looks Photoshopped. But and no matter how many times I put it, this is an actual photo. But uh, because I, I asked him to make sure, like, are you sure this didn't come from a picture postcard or something? And he said, no, I took that myself. So, and I believe him. So he gets around. All right, let me see here. Miss Terry. A little adjusting, a little site orientation here with these sessions. All right, now, this is another short one, um, eight, eight pages, which I have no problem with short sessions. Um, I'm just happy that you guys can find time in your lives to work sessions. I have a point to make about that. Uh huh. This is a good example of why you don't do two sessions in one day. Oh. Okay. Of why you don't. What? You want to expand on that? Well, I did two sessions. I was really busy over Thanksgiving, so I did two sessions in one day. Within a couple of hours, I think, of each other. And I drew, on the second session, I drew what looks exactly like the wheel. Um, but not on this session. I did it on the follow the session I did afterwards. Mm-hmm. Um, the target for that is muddy in the target pool, and uh, it happens a lot, uh, especially when you have uh, targets together. Um, and, you know. I'll let you get that. Mentally in close proximity. I don't not spatially in close proximity, but mentally. Uh, and it's just called muddy in the target pool, and uh, your your subconscious seems to want to do both of them at the same time. Okay, it wasn't even part of it was part, it was a session it was a target that was part of a different pool of sessions. But mentally, mentally they were probably together in your mind. Yes, definitely, I think. And. Um... Here, the PS, does that stand for previous session? Yes. Good job. <laughs> Which is this first? Just take it more seriously. <laughs> uh, and also, we had a little chat about maybe um, not trying to do sessions for other people because of lead through. No, they're both your sessions. Okay. Um, I know there's something about previous sessions I was going to. Oh, was this session first or was the other one first? This session was first. Wait, yeah, because wait, you said yes. Yeah. yeah, the wheel was on the other one. Yeah. That why? Yeah, that doesn't make sense. But you should look at that picture, Teresa. It's like exactly the wheel, <laughs> unless you have okay. that in that other session target. Well, it might be. There are a lot of wheels in the world. There's a lot of man-made that are shaped like wheels. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, I did a session once, you know, that I, it's just very coincidental sometimes, too. So okay. That's true. All right. Good structure in phase one. Um, Can I say something about the previous session thing there? Sure. Um, this, is, this is trivia, okay? Uh, studies have been done on on uh, predictions and, you know, the brain studies and, and all this. And um, they tend to find that we don't predict the future. We remember it because the same parts of the brain that are used in memory retrieval are used in prediction. And uh, so it's very, very possible that in doing this session first, you had the 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 impression of the previous session. I don't know. This may have been 
reference back to a session you had the day before or something like that. But um, but they're finding out that when we do predictive uh, work in remote viewing, we tend to be using the same parts of our brain that are used for memory retrieval. That is that's, tri that's trivia. Yeah, that's really interesting. Which always leads me to that little story I told you that happened here in real time is if I remembered the future, if I didn't bring it wasn't necessarily that I predicted what was going on, but if I remembered the future. <laughs> so um, I wanted to bring up, by the way, uh, you had a preview of coming attractions, which were flowers and purple. And if I think I can trust my machine to uh, not lock up with ads and stuff, I wanted to show you a picture. I didn't want to add it to the feedback just because you got the preview of coming attractions, but I did want to show you. Because um, there's all kinds of seasonal pictures of this target site up. Um, so, okay, we're working with a lot of good cells here. You've got man-made and biological and movement. There was a land in there, too. Uh-huh. I was kind of hiccuping. I think I skipped it. Sorry about that. And another man-made. And so now we're in phase two and we're running with it. We've got top edge and green and purple, cream and orange tinged. Nice. So that those colors are definitely there. You have cylindrical. And Lynn, um, she's going to get to intermediate very shortly just because I think it's going to help her structure because uh, she's, she has sketches breaking through all over the place. And we're going to be, as I say, going over the intermediate manual here very shortly, making sure she knows her structure for basic. Um, and I think that just to fast track her a little bit is going to help a lot because she was doing some viewing before she came to us with her CRV structure training. And uh, I think her viewing is happening no matter what. So I don't know if that made any sense. Yeah, I think that's going to be good for her. Um, remember, I haven't seen on any of these sketches mm -hmm. uh, little number points. Yeah. And when you're in stage three and you're doing a sketch like this, remember that the stage three sketch is an ideogram, and you can go back and feel it, just like you can a stage one ideogram. Yeah. And um, that the stage three ideogram covers the entire page, even though you may have only one little pencil mark down in the corner like this, uh, you can still go up into the empty space around the page or whatever and feel, and all of a sudden you'll find something about the target. Because... You're in stage three after you've had the uh, AI, and the target is now surrounding you. And so you can go all over this page and find stuff. And uh, when you find something, you know, you just tap around the page. And when you find something, you mark it with a number, come down into your uh, descriptor column, and put the number and say, at point number six, there's black and it's hot and smooth and metallic and then you keep going around the page and so um oh here's a there was a one right above the right the, i keep and, looking to see if there's any place where she might have had an ai early yeah that part's actually really confusing to me because i think i often if i i'll have an ai but it may be after one um Gestalt, and I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to start going into P3. And so I feel like I need to go through all the um, different elements first. Well, actually, uh, okay. Let's say you have stage one, and you go into stage two, and you say red, and all of a sudden there's the red right in front of you. Yeah. Uh, from that point on, you're basically in stage three. But you still have that descriptor column over on the left. So you just stay in stage three. 
and uh, and you can sketch what's right in front of you, and you still are picking up sensories and dimensional, so you can still write them down in the left side of the column. And um, yeah, your subconscious is going to do what it wants to do. <laughs> I mean, you put it in charge of things; it's going to do what it wants to do. And so, um, yeah, sometimes you just have to go with it. Um, I know there have been some sessions where I would get like uh, one to two descriptors in stage two, and all of a sudden, not only the AI, but I would all of a sudden be in stage six, measuring and, you know, finding the scales of things and the relative scales of them and all that. And um, there are just going to be some targets where your mind says, hey, I'm not waiting for you, fella, you know. And it just does it, and you just sort of have to hang on. So don't worry about that. I can always go back and pick up those other stuff sure. if I want then, yeah, if I need to right. or if I want to, or do I definitely do it? Uh, if you if you feel the need to, like you, uh, your mind suddenly makes you jump into stage three or four, mm-hmm. and... Uh, and you're working along and you realize you don't have enough of the basic information. Okay, drop back into stage two. Okay. Uh, pick up some information. Then um, once you pick up some, some basic, you know, centuries and dimensionals, one of them's going to kind of stand out and you say, okay, I'm going to cue with that. You cue with that and all of a sudden you're back in the uh, stage three or four or, or whatever. Okay. I don't know for yet, but okay. <laughs> one of the things that I've always said, and uh, uh, the purists really hate me to say this, the real purpose of the structure is to get you so in touch and so organized that you don't need to worry about the structure anymore. Okay. Uh, so saying it another way, the real purpose of the structure is to get you to where you don't need it. <laughs> right. But that's true. Yeah. And um, you give your subconscious the right to do this. Yeah. It's going to, you put it in charge because it is the viewer and the viewer has to be in charge of the session. You put it in charge and yeah, it's, uh, it's going to take off many times. And, uh, then the purpose of the structure is just to get you organized so that you can get the information in an organized way. Okay. Okay. Thank you. The structure is still important. Though. Yeah. I have Teresa. I know. <laughs> I think um, once you get into intermediate, things are going to get better. Yeah. I, I just, uh, it almost, this session almost looks like when you first started with all your sketches breaking through every place. And I by the way, I, he, I like this guy. This uh, flat platform light stopped going up at the top. It's rain divided area that's got darker colors. You know, we can always zoom in on that photo over there just to play around and see what it looks like. By the way, never be afraid to do that with your target feedback. Zoom in on this stuff, okay? Okay. And that way, you know, which we'll do just so we can show you how to do it and make sure that you realize that it's a, a valuable tool. But, huh, looks to me like that might have a different little bit of a shape right there, maybe. But here, um, I think Lynn, down at the bottom, is that, does that, this whole thing rotates, I think, doesn't it? No. Um, no. Where, what actually grinds the form? Okay, looking at this, it's uh-huh. a covered, it's got a, a covered top on it. Uh-huh. And looking at this, the seed seems to blow in through this um, curved shoot. Uh huh. And since it's covered, oh, uh, there are only one of two options. One is to run it and then stop it, take the cover off and scoop the mm-hmm. the flower out. And the other is, and this is quite often the truth, that um, 
that they will have a hole in the middle mm -hmm. so that it so that the powder drops down mm -hmm. into a receptacle below the spool. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell from this which it is. <laughs> if it is a uh, um, thing coming up, uh, there would be some kind of a motor or some or motor a um, a gearing system from mm -hmm. the paddle wheel to this thing, and it would look like the the grinding wheel mm -hmm. has to be turned by a shaft that's in the middle of this uh, mm -hmm. of this grinding uh, area here. I wish I could have found more feedback photos, but I just did not. I I probably spent over an hour and we're doing supposition here, but uh, I know. Yeah, but uh, from the looks of this thing, there's no there's no uh, shaft going down into the middle of this thing. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be a shaft coming up from the bottom. Mm -hmm. uh, something's got to turn that wheel. And it looks like this is this almost it, down at the bottom. It's got that ring. I just think that this thing has to rotate, but I'm not sure. I'm, I've seen them in action, but I'm not a, you know, maybe one or two in my life. Yeah, this may be one where uh, this whole top rotates and this um, curved um thing that would bring the sand in or the the uh the seeds in uh would somehow blow it in between this top and the bottom on here but then you would still have to have some place for the for the uh flower to go and it's obviously not spilling out the sides between these two things mm -hmm. so yeah we just like I say, we're doing supposition here, you know, using logic, but something's going to make something turn in there to get that um, stone to grind the grist. So say, let's take a look at her summary and see what she kept. Uh, Man-made consists of tall, slender, vertical, cylindrical, tubular shape. Portion of the exterior is light, colored, flat, smooth-sided, and fairly plain. In one or more areas, there are ring-shaped sections forming curved lines. Curved lines appear to connect with one another. Seem individually cylindrically shaped, which means they seem to protrude out a bit. Feels open in the center. Something moves up in the interior to the top ceiling. However, the ceiling seems enclosed in flat. Roof feels like that, it, like it can still be accessed in some way, as though something could stand on it, possibly people. There is an extremely strong feeling of rising up within this man-made. It feels like the man-made is an open environment and primary to the state, to this scene. It is something to be viewed. Well, it's, yeah, what I said about that photo. It is a, a very, very popular photo. Uh, land element feels like a distant scene where two elements connect, possibly land and sand or land and water. There's also a land type of element at the base of the large man made, forming a circular shape around it. There are two main movement elements, upward motion within the man made, which feels as if it happens repeatedly. There's an impression of movement on the roof of the man made. There is a launching movement taking place, like something is being thrown up into the air or expelled outward. It feels intentionally directional. It feels as though some type of force is involved with this as well. The biological element consists of the movement of what seems like arms and legs in many different crooked directions within a fairly confined space. It appears to take place in a tight, work-like environment. The area may be of metallic construction. There may be a window or opening into another area from this spot. The colors in this area seem predominantly dark and gray. There appears to be something happening at the base of the man-made. There may be an, an energy or force radiating outward at or near the base. Overall, the environment seems business-like, but fun and interesting. So that was a good description of a tourist attraction. Uh, yeah, but also of the... Uh... 
connections between mm -hmm. the water wheel, which is down below mm -hmm. this house, and whatever connections are made to turn this thing, because it's obvious that whatever turns on this thing mm -hmm. has got to be driven from below. And have you ever seen the um, the uh, linkage that are made in the old grist mills? They're all made out of lumber, and the gears are made out of uh, basically just spokes that uh, grind against each other. Now, this is a replica, and so there's no way to tell on this without further uh, feedback. But the uh, you can tell from the first picture that the wheel is down below, and the... Uh, uh, wheel has got to turn something that's then going to have to be linked with a vertical shaft and that vertical shaft will go up and turn that wrist mill. Mm. So I would say that's a good description. We will have the other other um session for the the wheel. <laughs> well I'm not sure which which target it was. It's one of the public ones, so we can't talk about it. So yeah. I'll take a look. Do you happen to remember which coordinates it was? I'll All write right. it down here. All right here. It's one, it's 13, 11, 10, and it's page 12. I'll take a look. Anything else you'd like to bring up? No, I'm good. Okay. Thanks for sending. Okay. And uh, Lisa Hinshaw does have a question over in the text area, and we'll get to the Mojo session. Um, she's got the place that this information comes from is not bound by time, perhaps. Uh, and she's not a remote viewer, Lynn. She's somebody who's got had a lot of experiences, and we've had some telephone conversations. So would, is there any way you can, in a nutshell, talk time and space for her for just a second? Yeah, um, I'm not sure from the way that question is phrased what not bound by time means. Mm -hmm. Of course, everything that exists is bound by time in some way. Um, but um, um, the thing is that this thing here, uh, you were saying earlier is sort of a compilation of all a bunch of historic things. And so, um, so historically, this would be a very bad target <laughs> because you've got things coming from all over the place in many directions at different times and all that. So, um, if you were doing a historical remote viewing, this target would Pretty well suck. But uh, if you, uh, you know, are doing the location and the man-made and all that, then, yeah, you've got a time constraint here of when it all came together from all the different parts because that's when this thing came to be. And so um, I would say, yeah, there is a boundary of time on this one. Um, looking at it another way, philosophically, you know, how long have people been grinding grain to make bread? Come on, you know, that's almost uh, eternal <laughs> as far as the human race is concerned. And so depending on how you look at it, but I would say on this target to describe it as a location, yeah, it's pretty well bound in time. I don't know if that answers the question that was asked. Um, I think when she's talking about the place, I think she means the matrix, the source of information. Yeah, and on that, you know, you could, that's like arguing how many angels can dance at the head of a pen. I mean, you could, mm -hmm. you could talk and talk and discuss and discuss about what time is uh, 
what boundaries are placed on time, time loops, the time loops have beginnings and ends, and uh, things like this. That's all philosophical. And so uh, if you're talking philosophical, maybe this place is not bound by time. I don't know. I, I tend to be more um, non-philosophical. Wow. I guess that's a good politically correct term. <laughs> well, I'm thinking yeah. that if you're working operations, you know, maybe that's got something to do with, the, you know, you're getting, your, getting right down there and in the thick of things. So maybe philosophy is kind of taking a back seat. Uh, remote viewing is great for philosophy and great for uh, conceptual information and all that. Uh -huh. But you start giving something like that to a cop and there's a missing kid, uh -huh. uh, he's going to just show you the door and never use you again, you know. Uh -huh. And so at some point, uh, at some point, I sort of fall back on the fact that I was trained to do this in the military for military reasons and uh, we had to be pretty hard nosed about it. Yep. Uh, here is a shot that I did not include in the in the photo or in the actual feedback information. So you can see some of the open area and the bridge beside it. Um, and I was thinking, Mich or not Michelle, sorry, Terry, there was one photo that had some purple pictures in it, but it was probably in some of the like trip advisors or something like that where I was roaming around. So but they were some of the prettiest purple flowers I've ever seen. So, there was one that you uncovered just uh we scrolled past a few minutes ago that was uh -huh. purple flowers. Right. I wasn't sure though. That almost looks like a career and I painting. You know, it's not really a photo, I don't think. Yeah, it could be. So but anyway, uh, it was more of a real picture with real purple flowers, whatever I saw. Over here, but that's not what I there was it is. Uh-huh. Oh, this one? Yeah. Uh-huh. Rhododendrons. I love rhododendrons. But anyway, I thought we might have a couple minutes there. I was looking for the purple flowers for Terry. I said I would, so. And it hasn't, WebEx hasn't thrown me out yet, so. Oops. All right, uh, Mojo session coming right up. Um, nine pages. And um, he is just converting over to CRV. I mean, he's been doing it on his own, but was getting just tons of information reminding me of Russ. And uh, now he's kind of moving into more of the typical structure insofar as phase one with his coordinates and ideograms and then going over into the IAB sequence. And he's got multiple ideograms here. He's even breaking out. And I'm sorry, Mojo, I don't remember if you were doing this before. You probably were. And then uh, moved into phase two and he didn't realize um, that perceptions go on the left and all the stray cast and the notes and the breaks and all that go on the right. So we emailed back and forth about that. So that was kind of an aha moment for him this week. So that was fun. But he got into phase five and I've got some real zingers of emails from him, um, all kinds of questions and whatever. So I'm probably going to have to pretty much give this discussion up to you guys here in a minute because I'm sure he's going to have a lot to ask you and hope your voice holds out. But um, he went into phase two and then went something, you know, he got a bug about something on a man-made. And he wanted to work with, with the phase five tool right off the bat and see if he could find the kernel of information inside this now, which is this man-made. I'm not just plain old man-made. So if he did that, not a per specific perception, he did it on an entire gestalt. So anyway, that was something I noticed and I thought I didn't have a chance to email him back or begin to wrap my head around it. 
So. Uh, on that, the way mm-hmm. it's done that uh, stage mm-hmm. four tool would have been so much better for that than the stage five tool. Mm-hmm. Um, he wanted to investigate a gestalt, and I think that, you know, it, the whole purpose of doing a session is to get familiar structure and learn, so he did it. But um, I think that he could have probed it for perceptions instead of unpack. He didn't unpack a noun. Yeah, he was and trying to is, unpack a gestalt. Yeah, the thing is, the um, this phase five tool uh-huh. is not for finding out about the target. For finding right. information about the target, right. this particular yes. phase five tool is for just blowing out the pipes and you, when you're stuck. yeah, and you never take anything from this right here and move it into the summary. You never queue with it. You never anything. And so, basically, what you do is you blow out the pipes and then you go back to whatever session uh, phase two and right. just. Basically, kind of start over, start fresh. Right. That's so to wrap that. Sorry, Mojo. That's, that's sort of what I did. I felt very not connected to the target from the get-go. I felt very like far away. So therefore, I tried to do a, a P5 just to try and get more contact with the target, just to get uh, to open my mind up a little bit. Oh, good. Uh, the way uh, Teresa was. Explaining it, I thought you were trying to get more information about the man-made using this uh, that's particular. What it, that's what it looks like, and you know, to unpack to use phase five. I don't think he understood that it's to unpack and blow out the pipes. Yeah, and he's but, using it to get better sight contact. Yeah, and not to get information about the target, not to get descriptors of the target, but to simply get sight contact. And this is a good use of that. Uh, phase five tool. But I, I also know that usually phase five tool we don't bring out until after the phase three, but from the get go I felt so little contact than than usually. So therefore I tried it over here anyway. Yeah. I don't think it hurt anything. Um generally uh if you haven't reached phase um uh three yet and you want to get more site contact um, if you've gotten a dimensional, what you do is you take a separate page and uh, uh, let's say you've gotten that something is tall. And you, for tall, you would start at the bottom and you would say, okay, how tall is it? And you feel your way up the page. And that tactile contact with the page will actually bring you back to the target a whole lot faster than almost any other tool. Um, you know, but on that, you have to be, you have to have had a dimensional so far. I haven't noticed whether you did or not. Um, no, he pretty uh, much Dig, hit there you ground go. Ryan. Dig, you put your pen on the paper and you say, okay, how big is it? And you feel your way out across the paper and at some point you'll say, oh, wait a minute, it's not that big. And you go back in a little, and oh, I went too far. And you go back out, and you're feeling the way, you're feeling your way across the paper. And the whole time you're doing that tactile contact and um, and focusing on the feel, uh, then you're focusing on the feel, you're getting the shape, and that three-dimensional ideogram, that two-dimensional ideogram, will actually zoom you back to site contact a whole lot better than most of the other tools. So should I draw at that point, or that's just to feel it and then move on? Uh, if you're using the the tool number one, uh, phase five tool number one. Anything you get in here as um, as attributes, objects, subjects, or topics, you leave it there, you forget it, you move back to where you were after you get the site contact or after you blow the pipes out. And, uh, and as far as the 
official remote viewing session goes, that just never happened. Uh, you just forget all about it. Right. But when you were describing to feel the paper, how big, and, and, and keep the scaling down the paper, at that point, should I try to make a drawing? Or oh. that's just the feeling? No, uh, just the feeling of it. That's all you're after. And mm -hmm. uh, like I say, if, if you said tall, then you would start at the bottom of the page. Work your way up. If you said wide, you'd start at one side of the page and work your way across. If you said big, you could start in the middle of the page and feel outward in all directions and and say, well, how big is this? Oh, no, I've gone too far. No, I haven't gone far enough. And as you start doing that, you're focusing on the target to the point where it will just really almost suck you right straight into the target. Mm -hmm. And would an A, would a, a, if I shoot myself to an AI at that point in the, in the beginning of the target, would that be of any benefit? Uh, yeah, if you lose the AI, if you lose that spatial relationship to the target, it would. Now, that, that tool that I've been talking about, you know, how big is it, how tall is it, and all that, feeling it, uh, that's one way that, let's say you've been in stage two, for 15 or 20 pages and you can't get that AI, this is the tool that's normally used to force yourself to have an AI. Because as you're feeling, you'll say, oh, no, it's it's right here. You know, it's this tall, and it's this wide and all that. And you'll say, the edge of it is right here. And that establishes a spatial relationship between you and the edge of the target. And once you get that little bit of sight contact there, you you just go right ahead and, and get the rest of the sight contact. You'll you'll force yourself to AI. And Mojo, mm -hmm. are you picking up that we still are encouraging phase one and phase two and oh, getting yeah, the so AI? Sure. And, and not to be using this to fast track. That's right. And, you know, this is this is an emergency tool. <laughs> Just like you were using the um, Phase 5 as an emergency tool to go back and get site contact, uh, the best way um, for, for all of these is just by the numbers, Stage 1, Stage 2, Stage 3, Stage 4. Now, you will get to a point where you notice I was, I was saying before, uh, where your subconscious will say, I don't want to wait for you, and it will go ahead. But that's only on rare targets, okay? That's only on targets where your subconscious said, yeah, 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 I want this. And uh, for, for almost probably 90 to 95% of the targets you ever do, just Stick with the program. It works. The program will always carry you through. Which I would like to. I'm sorry? I wanted to get in here. He's learning this a little at a time. Um, Mojo, you need to, I just explained in an email, perceptions go on the left, your breaks and everything else go on the right, your straight cast or AOL. Never, ever write on the same line like all your administration stuff up here you write that and then you come down and then you start your ideograms and your gestalt and then you come down over here you never write everything all across at the same level okay yeah, so, and also phase five and yeah, also uh-huh, right here. Okay, see how those are all written across? Uh -huh. uh, what you're supposed to do Drop is attributes, down. go down, and then go over and down to start the objects column. When you finish it, go over and down to finish the subjects, and then over and down to finish the topic. Always keep going down the page. Yep. There are several reasons for that. One it keeps you moving forward in your session. But two, it also lets the 
analyst, if you if you're going to be working with an analyst, it also lets the analyst know what you wrote first and next and next and next. And um, a good analyst can often tell as much, if not more, about the, about what you got from the target by the order in which you get the information. And if you've got all the information on the same line, the analyst can't, you know, it's just kind of hog tied there. They can't, they can't tell what you got first and what you got next and what led to one thing and led to another. So always keep going down on the page. And just because we're kind of trying to cue you in phase one, phase two, if you don't think you have good site contact, I mean, as Lynn said, it didn't hurt anything to jump into phase five or phase five right there. But I, I really strongly encourage my students. I haven't had all that many, but do your coordinates three to five times. And granted, you're getting multiple gestalt. But I, before I did the, I don't feel like I have good site contact stuff and go down to this huge extent. I would practice a more traditional for a few targets to see if you felt any better. Yeah. Let me ask well, you, what, when you did the stage five, did that sure. give you? I can like for you. I'll put it that way. I feel that it, it, it um, not exactly. Okay. Um, like I've told people this before, I have had right. sessions where I have done 20 pages mm -hmm. of stage one before I ever even got the ideogram. That's the less site contact. You need more caffeine that day. Oh boy, I tell you. <laughs> Drink lots of coffee on that. <laughs> okay. And, Go ahead. So, so, you know, if you're doing stage one over and over and you're still not feeling like you get any site contact, uh, just keep going. And, uh, uh, you know, become a member of the 20 paper club like I did. <laughs> we, have lots, we have lots of members, by the way. <laughs> yeah, well, he only gets to take the trophy if he does 8,000 pages and 10 hours on all sand dunes. And there, done that. Yeah, you got that t-shirt. You did. And in the in the phase in the phase five, we learned like there's a in the phase five webinar, we learned so many uh, factors of the three tools of the phase four, the the phase five, uh, uh, the stage five. But the question is, many of them we, we learned not to use that information at all in the summary. However, in the in the, I think it's the, the second tool of the suitcase when we get like a, a, a massive amount of information at one time and we, we put a, a label on it and then we unpack it from last perception and, and work ourselves backwards. Is, is that sounds like a, 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 a phase five that would be added in the, that should be added in the summary, but from what was said, I understood that none of those three tools should be used in the summer. Is that no, correct? Not, no, only the one that you did, the state, the first tool, first phase five. That's the only one where you just dump all the information once you get it. Mm -hmm. uh, the other two, yeah, anything you get in those, you can queue with it. You can go back and zero in on it. You can put it into your summary and all that. You're absolutely right. Uh, the other two tools, you use the information, but the phase five tool number one, uh, you're just trying to get site contact, you're trying to blow the pipes out, and you're not even working the target. Uh, you're just making word associations. So when you finish with it, blow it off, uh, you know, and just ignore that it ever happened. Mm -hmm. And in the phase three, I see. I feel that I don't have. Uh, I'm not a. I'm not a draw. I don't really know how to draw. 
so well, but there were times where I did a session, for instance, when, when doctors uh, were getting, figuring out a problem with uh, somebody in the family, and I did a target and I drew out a nerve cell. I didn't even know what it was. It looked exactly like a nerve cell. And I had a like a phase five in the middle of the day, a, a phase seven, like, you know, I had to check DNA. I looked up DNA, it wasn't a DNA structure. But on that page in the in the website was a was a DNA structure, but at this, in the same picture was a, a picture of a nerve cell, and that was the exact thing that I drew. And then when I brought that to the doctor, they said that has to be it. And the problem that I, that I diagnosed with the nerve cell, they said that there's no there's you have to be correct according to all their knowledge, but there's no. There's no, um, they don't have any equipment that would be able to detect such a thing or to, to take a picture or to, to see such a thing. That's where, you smile, most, that's where you smile at them and say, yes, you do have a piece of equipment. You have. <laughs> <laughs> one, of the, uh, one of the things that made us very popular with a lot of the people in the military, the military has to pay for the equipment and the personnel. And for our unit, the equipment was the personnel, so they only had to pay half for us. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's that's where you say, "Hey, use me as the equipment. We get this done." Right, but most of the times, my P3s, they don't seem to, they don't, I don't, I'm not able to detect uh, so much of the target as as much as they are ideograms. I usually use them as ideograms that. that to drag off information of the target. But uh, one thing is that that information doesn't seem to be fitting to the, to, to the site of the description of the P3 or, or, and, and, and also the, the descriptions of the P3s, um, it's either like a, a very small part of the target or it, it doesn't seem to be the target at all. Okay, let me ask you a question. Were you originally taught that you have four dimensionals and then you will have an uh, an AI and then you're in phase three? Yes, I don't. I didn't get the the, the four dimension the dimensionals. And yes. uh, I, I usually like would do myself in AI. Now, let and, me tell you something. That is absolutely wrong. <laughs> <laughs> And there are a lot of people out there are a lot of teachers out there teaching it. And uh, there's a history behind that thing where Ingo made a certain remote viewer who kept screwing up all the time. He said, no, you've got to have four. I'm not going to let you have an AI before you have four dimensional. And that screw up. So that became gospel. Yeah, that screw up said, okay. You have four dimensionals, and then you will have an ideogram, and that's what he's been teaching his students. And, you will have uh, an AI. Yeah, an AI. I'm sorry. Um, stage three is a two-dimensional ideogram, and if you have the AI first, then you're not suing so much as doing uh, conceptual ideograms. You're doing um, uh, perceptual ideograms and pictogram, uh, pictographic uh, ideograms. Excuse me, my words aren't going right tonight. And um, and so, if you have the AI first and you have a real AI, none of this four dimensions that I'm going to start sketching. None of that stuff. Um, if you have a real AI, where all of a sudden you feel a spatial relationship to the target. If you have that, then stage three becomes just sketching what's around you. You don't have to do anything psychic. You just sketch what's around you or what's right in front of you or above you or something like that. And when you do that, that as it acts as a pictographic ideogram you can touch it in various places and you will get information about the target. So if you're doing stage three sketches and they're giving you bad information about the target, 
that usually indicates that you did not have a valid AI. Uh, and so an, an analyst, if you worked with an analyst, an analyst would see that you were getting bad information off your stage three sketches, and they would come back and start questioning you about AIs, not about stage three, because the analyst would say, I don't think you had a valid AI idea. But uh, this whole thing about you will have four dimensionals and then you will have an AI, uh, uh, just pray that you never heard that, <laughs> okay, because it's not true, not at all. They'll mm -hmm. have some dimensionals, but they might be all mixed in with uh, with other things, okay? No. You will um, have dimensionals before the AI happens. Mm-hmm. And, you know, rule, you know, to make a rule like that is just ridiculous. Yeah. And I've been scrolling down through your session, and what you need to, and I know you're new at listening to us, but... um. To, that's an interesting noise. Um, you know, you've got to look at each one of these perceptions and you ask yourself if they're at the target. Uh, big, clanky, noises, movement. Um, and then that's the way you look at whether or not your perceptions are accurate yeah. when you are scoring and trying to learn how you do things. But um, I'd like to sort of say, you have a tendency to like i don't i don't know if if i can say you're off target or castle building per se only in that you're doing an awful lot of supposing and back and forth with perceptions but like it's got down here um you really fixated on sports stuff and maybe in the winter time they do play hockey on this but it, there's no indication of that in the feedback photo. But um, like here, I'd like to see you try and work your way out of this habit of PS I sense from competition for sure. That's you're you're not supposed to be for suring anything. You write a perception. You're going down the left hand side of the page. You get a perception and write it down. You get a perception and write it down. You get a perception and write it down. For suring is analyzing in session for one thing, and that's not your job. Because 99.9% .9 of the time, you're going to be wrong. And if you ever get to the point where you're trying to depend on yourself for accuracy, that's the one thing that you don't want to do is try and figure stuff out right and left. We're not doing kill shot here. We're not, you know, making predictions that are going to be the fate of the nation where sensory descriptions across time and space. Yeah, and you've got to understand that the subconscious mind doesn't always make sense. And so when you're going along and you say, oh, no, that doesn't feel right to me, that's your that's your conscious mind trying to take over the session. Uh, you make a note. Yeah, you make a note and you keep on. And when this gets to the really severe problem of it. I've seen many, many people who will get something like red. Then they turn around and get green. Oh, no, it can't be green. And so they don't even write green down. Uh, they can't, it can't be green because I said it was red. And, uh, and they'll get red and then they'll get round and rubbery because there's something red at the target, something round at the target, and something else rubbery. And then they'll say, oh, it must be a ball. Therefore, there are people playing ball, and therefore, and they start letting the conscious mind take over. And and uh, it just doesn't work. The subconscious mind is the viewer, and it has to be in charge of the session. Right. Well, what I was so, trying to Go ahead. What I was trying to do over here was the AOLs that I that I, I threw out during my session. I tried to P5 them and say I, I sort of I I thought that maybe there's something in common with all of them. I took them all together and I said what's in common with them, and I would and that's when I came up with this. Uh, it seems to be a, a competition 
but I, I knew that the, the, a, the AOL is something that we throw away and that we don't pay attention to. Right. And what does AOL stand for? Analytic overlay. And so soccer ball, trophy, flyers, hockey, goalie, fighting, puck. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. P.S. I sense from them. Okay. You have just analyzed. That is analytic overlay at its finest. <laughs> right. It has reared its ugly you head and get, went tall. You can't get <laughs> your example of analytic overlay then, then right in those three lines right there. I sense from them. <laughs> right. And so whenever you play with nouns, you're playing with fire. Yeah. Uh huh. Well, folks, um, I do have one more session here that is not scanned in that I would at least like to get on the recording. So, um, Mojo and Lynn, if you had any more comments on your session, um, I'd like to go ahead and wrap that up if we well, could, from please. Seen, from what I saw before and what I see now, he's coming along great. Uh -huh. And it's uh -oh. hard. I mean, everybody that's here tonight has pretty much, well, uh, Michael's a, I think, your student straight up. But, I mean, a, a good portion of people who are here have done session work in other ways and are trying to convert the CRV structure. So everybody's working hard at unlearning bad habits and combining what they already have in a skill mix into structure. So, you know, everybody is feeling for everybody, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Um, and Michelle is not with us tonight, but I have her session here and I didn't have time to scan it in. Uh, she's, let me see, I won't read it all verbatim. I think we're looking at about 10 or 12 pages, maybe uh, nine. Boy, I tell you, this is a short target tonight, um, which is fine. I kind of like it that way, but, um, She's got, she had a stray cat and then a sketch, and I think she might have been making sight contact with this. She's got, uh, looks like, it, she's got large rounded, and then it looks like Barney, but I don't think that's right. Uh, then she has arch shaped temple, pale golden color, buttery shade, and it's a mixture, mixture slash stone. And then she has a sketch underneath it. And then I'm skimming here. The middle and darker is different than the colors up above and below. And she's at, she makes a note. She's trying to get sight contact and orientation. I'm checking to see if I have my bearings and I will be aware of centering my stance and relaxing for best description of this target. And it's a note off to the right. So that's nice. So I know what's going on. Now I'm behind, just behind the structure and a huge orangey sunset up ahead of me. I way ahead, so I'd like to try to sketch it. And she's enlarged her sketch. I'm trying to look. It, it looks like a kettle at the bottom and a big huge arch over the top. Oh, let me see that second picture. Oh, jeez. Is practically the second the interior picture. Oh gosh. Um, squatty squared, low sitting, place of worship and com community balance. Okay. Uh, up, she's pointing to the base of the round dark part at the bottom. Um, large hulled, strong shaped boat feel, huge dynamic, Sunset orange and glowing, and there is coming in the window behind there. It's very sunny. This feels messy and out of order, but I'm going to go with it. And it's old, and she's got broad square stone path. It's crude, earthy, old, and well used. Heritage map site, clustered areas, stray cat, a dark road at night with crude, jagged stone, creamy white, gray color. Waist high but little taller, and there is that picture of that bridge. We wouldn't want to use bridge. That's a noun. 
However, if it is like a road, do you guys remember that photo? I guess I'm talking to myself. No, there's um, a neat, neat bridge right there beside it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is like a road. I'm not saying it is. Possibility. Uh, it is for effect. You are here, not stopping, no stopping. Then we've got dark, smooth, black, oily finish. Trying to look old, but it's new, and the contrast is off and obvious. Almost tacky, not thought out. The stone wall made of the narrow, long hmm, slivers of rough to the touch white gray color, pointy pieces toward the top part. And she's still describing a road, so we don't have any close-ups of any roads. Then she's got arid, dusty, and blowing, and she feels like there's Mediterranean or Morocco vibes, and... Laid back is in no hurry. It's a luxurious area, and there are large plots of well-monitored, maintained structures. And then she says, stray cat, I saw the dome shape. Uh, not stray cat, the dome is like a flat umbrella with visible thick seams. It feels gold. Oh, gee. She's got a sketch here that's round and little lines going out from the center. And um, if it's the top of that interior structure, by the way, is that flower coming up out of there? What do you guys think? What is this stuff right here? I was thinking that's a shoot that the seed went down into. Uh, it could be that it's under pressure and blows the flower out. I have no idea. Yeah, me either. But to me, this almost looks with the, the buttery yellow shades and stuff. It, it looks, looks like ground. I think it looks like ground up cornmeal, but I don't know. They, they wouldn't let it pile up over the top like that. Right. And, and that's why I was looking at this stuff at the bottom like it's a spill area or something, but it sure is cleaned up for the photo shoot. I'll put it that way. I don't know. It's just weird. I wish I knew what that was. So um, maybe we should have somebody remote viewer and answer that question. Then it changed almost the shape of a planetarium with a side panel wide hatch. Oh, jeez. Look at this, you guys. If you, if you know what a planetarium looks like with an open hatch. Um, metal tops, metal thin, cold to the touch, banging sound, surprisingly sheer and thinly layered. Oh, we have a new word in quotation marks. It's a stray cat, and it's, she's writing disturbia. Hmm, a new mm -hmm. word. Yes, <laughs> that's a pretty cool word, disturbia. Um, let's see, broad, curvy walled, deep cut, thick openings, almost flares out on the side. Stony feel is ancient, simple, elegant. The shape is almost teapot cute, but when you stand next to it, it is very, very large and impress impressive. Um, inside with tall metal standing castle stands with tubular glass of red glow, stark clean. Oriental type carpet on a stone floor. Well, maybe not so much there. Narrow wooden bars separate spaces. Uh, intention of participation. Stone, I don't know. By the way, the one sketch, she doesn't have the wheel on the outside down to a T, but she does have a circular sketch that has spokes. And then it looks like, if you imagine an old wagon wheel with spokes, and then a ladder laying right across the center of it and little clamps. So I'm not sure what that means. Unless she's looking down, she doesn't really have it from the down perspective. See this wheel off to the left? It's got, it looks like it might have a bar going through it, maybe. This, oops. this one over here, I'm not seeing any bars. 
this one I can't tell. This might be something that attaches it to a wall. Anyway, I'm just looking for things in session that she might be describing. Um, let's see, stone, bowel, pestle type container that's holding holy water. She's very big on that. I know my viewers. Um, gold marking cross or squares as a design element. She's going to church on me again. P2 motion. Uh, we've got, looks like chair, but that's not the right spelling. Flash pulley. Hoisting up, dropping down, standing, kneeling, prostating, sounding as a tone, not singing. Nice rumble of a home sound of a large group holding vibrations and certain notes. She's singing. It is in the bones, almost causing movement or feeling of being moved. We've got coming and going, paying respects, and then leaving. This is a touristy area, but I'm just saying. Wanting people to see you here doing this. Not that you note tricky something. I feel that most here, it is for show. It is pleasant and positive, but they are not that into it, and I see a lack of enthusiasm, that's all. And then her last page, she has, um, she's still getting religious and cultural pride, meeting area, very grounded, dignified and, and respect. I see tall, bush-like trees lining buildings on each side of the of the structure main structure, dark green, tall tree-like shape, like surfboards or feathers. And she does have thick, looks like poplar trees, actually. That shape. And fresh vibe, Lindy poplars, the tall skinny ones. Uh, fresh vibe, gardening wealth of variety, color and shapes, and smells, water area, light features, feel square or long pendulum and then she has a sketch that looks like um, it looks like the center part of a gas lantern where just the, the glass would be and then with the lines and the crisscrosses and then an egg shape in the center of that with a curved line underneath the egg so unless I'm looking at that dome thing there. But she's looking, there's a window that's paned behind it. And then she's got recap down the bottom of the note. Since she's not here, um, she's thinking that if I want to repass her, she can. So that is the end of her session, and I wish you could have seen it, because there's a lot of, I think, really spot-on data here. Especially these sketches. Um, can we, you know, that's a, what a great idea. All right, let me, I bet you we probably could. Could do what? Ron, Ron, oh, oh, what? I'm sorry. We could rent a bus and go there as a group. <laughs> uh, come to my house? Oh, gee. Uh, no, to the to the grist mill. Oh, to the, yeah, I gotcha. I thought so you could see her sketches. All right, I'm just thumbing through them here, pulling out. Oh, of course, do you think I can find it? No. Trying you to go hold him up to the camera. Yep, that's my plan. Okay, here we go. Um, let me know if you can you see this at all. Oh, that's neat. Yep, and when you look at that second, yeah, the interior. I think yeah, there's def some... definitely yeah. Oh, I like it when you say definitely. I'm <laughs> kind of tiptoeing in, going. I think because, you know, you're going to say never, you know, you, there are some real possibilities here. And you're like, definitely. Okay, good. Um, then 
you know, if she's not here, she probably wants to be retapped. Okay, then down at the bottom was what I was trying to describe. You see that? Like one of those uh, uh, valve wheels or whatever, yeah. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking over if my arm's not in the way, then I can see. Okay, I need to go this way. So then we have that. And then here on the last page, Okay, here are the, the pointy things. Hang on, I have to orient my page here. Oops, there we go. Here we go, this way. Okay. I don't know if anybody has any thoughts on those. We've got all kinds of perpendicular stuff inside here. She's not usually laying on her, she sometimes lays on her side, I think, sometimes at the site. And here's what I was seeing, trying to figure out. That dome thing is in the center, and then behind it, sorry, is the window. And there are panes in the window. And I'm not trying to waffle, I just always like to look and see if I have matches. I don't think I would go with that if I were the analyst. Okay. Trying to see if there's something else there that kind of looks like a lantern, but not really. So anyway, that will be all of her session right there. I mean, granted, you didn't get to see it all, but there we have it. Yeah, I think she had a lot of good information there. Me good, too. Indicated good site contact, yeah. Uh, could I take a little bit of time and say, I know we're getting short on time right now, but say something that I think is really important. Well, of course. Uh, the AI is absolutely critical to doing a good session. If you don't get site contact, then you're not going to do a good session. And usually, stage one and two lead you up to the AI and many times, a uh, large, large number of times, you will not get site contact until you have the AI. And so if you're going through stage one and two and say, I don't have site contact yet, go with it. Uh, turn it over to your subconscious. It's not making sense. Hey, that's great. But generally, Notice, let me underline the word generally and put it in all caps and all that, <laughs> and little feelers on both sides of it. Generally, you will not have an AI until after you've started getting dimensional impressions of the site. And so that's why um, people, you know, especially an analyst, will look for dimensionals leading up to an AI. That doesn't mean that you have to have dimensionals before the AI. You can have the AI shoot halfway through writing your coordinates. And uh, um, the the thing with the you will have four, you know, dimensionals and then you will have an AI. Ingo told that to the guy because the guy was screwing up right and left and not getting dimensionals, and not really having AI, but declaring, a, you know, an emotion, a strong emotion, oh, I just had an AI. And um, and so Ingo said, no, I'm not even going to let you get away with one dimensional. I'm going to make you have four dimensionals before I will ever let you write the word, you know, the letters AI. And that's where that came from. And... Uh, and the word generally here applies, okay? Um, generally, 90% of the time, probably, a straight session, this straight structure is going to be required. 
there are times when your subconscious says, I'm not waiting for you. And like I say, right in the middle of, shoot, right in the middle of writing your coordinates, you may have an AI and be ready to go into stage three, four, and, and so on. Uh, but that won't happen all the time. And so, um, Teresa is absolutely right. Don't, don't try to use that as a way to get through a session fast because it'll mess you up. And, uh, um, the AI is not signaled by a strong emotion. Sometimes you will have the AI, something will be right in front of you, and you say, well, what's the emotion tied to that? And the emotion is, eh, so what? <laughs> I mean, no, just, you know, almost a lack of emotion will be the emotion. And so, um, so the people who say that a strong emotional is an AI, they're wrong. The people who say you will have four, uh, dimensionals and then your next impression will be an AI, they're absolutely wrong. Um, the AI is you're building this virtual reality that, that describes the site and all of a sudden you plop yourself into it. And so the red or the round or whatever is suddenly in front of you or beside you or above you or below you or something like that. And you spatially relate to it. Once you get that spatial relationship, stage three becomes just easy as it can be because all you're doing then is just sketching what's around you. You sketch what's around you and that sketch comes from your subconscious mind, which makes it an ideogram. And so then when you go in to start working stage three for information, you just touch around that drawing and you'll get information about the target because it is an idiot. Uh, just like Mojo said, it is an idiot. And, uh, Mojo is absolutely right about the stage five. That tool number one is the only one where you throw stuff away. The other stuff, the other two stage five tools, that's valuable information and people. Yeah. So, but anyway, it's you know really how we important. learned that. Yeah, it's really important to know what the AI is because you've got so many people out there giving bad information about the AI and it just hurts your session. So anyway, now, do, you, do you know how he learned the different tools and, and keeping and not keeping? A webinar. I'm sorry, what? You know how he learned his question about keeping things and not keeping things and stuff like that? From, From listening. Webinar? Listening Our, to a webinar presentation. Hours? Yep. Oh, really? Yep. I so that's how that. he knows. That's how he, well, no, you just said, you, uh, not P1, but you keep the stuff. In the P1 tool that he used, you don't keep. And the other P tools have valuable information. So anyway, all this learning that he's doing about P5 right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And all his questions yeah. came from listening to our webinar. Well, uh, you know, you can't retain everything. I, I know that in the basic course, mm -hmm. this is why um, I never charge anyone for follow-up and, you know, information from the basic course. Mm -hmm. uh, you pay for the basic course, and for the rest of your life, you can take it over and over again, free of charge and consultation unlimited because you cannot remember everything. Right. It's and just so, a, so, I mean, he's finding, he's been listening all these months and picking up a lot of stuff. And so, you know, all this sharing is helping people. That makes me feel good. Good. I'm glad. Yeah. And, you know, it may be repeated because you can't remember everything. Even uh -huh. if you're taking notes, uh, you can't remember everything. So, um, yeah, I, I just hope that I didn't lead anybody astray on that. No. I just um, wanted to come back and clarify the thing about the AI. I gotcha. Michael, did you have a question or something? Yeah, I got one quick question. Um, 
what happens when you want to start sketching early on, like you're not even through phase two, you haven't quite had an AI yet, but you got the impression that you want to start sketching? Sketch. Yeah, okay. Just go to the P3 and start sketching. Listen, if your subconscious says sketch, sketch. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's that's the only question I have. Thanks. Now, let me tell you something else uh, about that P2 sketch. If you feel of the P2 sketch, like you say, oh, this is a certain shape, and I don't know the name for this shape, so you just draw it. That's not an ideogram. That's an explanation. And you go back and feel it, you're not really going to feel hardly anything, uh, if anything at all. But if you do a P3 sketch, just, I mean, phase two sketch, just sort of spontaneously, and you go back and you feel of it, and you're getting information off of it, mm -hmm. I would say 99.999% of the time, you had an AI before that that you didn't catch. Right, because like I was doing a session for this one, and I got the impression of, okay, there's this arched, you know, curve thing above me and stuff like that, but I haven't even gotten into like P2 yet. Oh, no problem. You had the you had the AI. You're good to go. But you just go, you know, go ahead and do the P3, but then go back and do a P2 later. You, you can. can, or you can go ahead and work your way through P2 to get uh, words that you could cue with in phase three and phase four and, and so on. Oh. Uh, at that point, you've had the AI, and you're in contact with the target, and so you can drop back to phase one, phase two. You can drop immediately to phase six. You can drop immediately to phase four. Once you have that site contact, which is what the AI is, oh, man, you just okay. you open the gate and let the horses run free. I mean, you know, <laughs> you've got the target once you get that site contact. Okay, thanks. I was looking to see if you had actually written that someplace. The uh, arching thing? Uh-huh. Uh, go back to page four. Right at the bottom, there's like cold temp, something arching. Something arching right. above me. There you go. Okay, so... That was basically AI and Yep. Uh huh. Yeah, there's your AI. Yeah. My goodness. Oh, it's my son. I'm sorry. You all just talk amongst yourselves. Hey. So uh, anyway, no, we're just finishing class. Uh, Can I call you back in a couple minutes? I hope I didn't screw anybody right. up with the explanation today. Okay, I'll tell you back in just a few, okay? Uh, but the AI, the AI is a critical part of the session. Sorry. You, you've once given a, a, a great exercise of how to get in touch with colors to start opening up and a person uh, starts recognizing in his whole lifestyle Every color that it, in, in, that it can possibly think of in all the places that he goes and, and, and his experiences, and also with the mention to start recognizing the different shapes that, that are in the world. And uh, that I found that, that that brings in an enormous help. I think you mentioned that in your, in your book, The Seventh Sense. And I was wondering if there's any exercise like that to, to get a person uh, more in touch with uh, AI. Uh, there probably is one that could be developed. I haven't seen one developed. And uh, um, throughout, uh, you know, I was in the unit for, what, eight and a half years. And throughout that whole time, they were saying, develop exercises that will help. And um, the exercises that are in the back of the book are the ones that stuck. Um, the the only other one that's not in there, 
And I think it helps you get in touch with the site and get that AI. Is um, there's a course by Betty Edwards called uh, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain. It's not a remote viewing course. It's an art course. And uh, you can buy the book and the workbook that goes with it, and you don't have to go to a class or anything. But the um, the uh, course, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain by Betty Edwards, uh, was one of them that we just kept uh, uh, throughout all the years. And I really think it helps you get in touch with the title because it puts you in touch with the paper. Uh, remember that the subconscious and the conscious mind only talk to each other through the body. And that's why that's why that tactile contact with the paper, that's why getting your nose down on the paper and saying, is it this big, is it this tall? No, it's not that tall. And that tactile, tactile contact with the paper, that will suck you into the target. And uh, Betty Edwards' course, I think, uh, will actually help you very much with uh, your ability to get in contact with the target, to have the AI. Uh, folks, mm -hmm. I'm going to, before I lock up here, uh, before the new year, I'll make sure that my PC is cleaned up and we don't have these issues, but uh, we're starting to have some PC issues. And I think before, uh, we need to formally wrap up our evening, okay, before we lock up the way I did last week. So um, thank you for everybody for, for this entire year. I feel like we should grab some glasses and toast each other because uh, this is a pretty faithful group. Everybody comes and goes, you know, we all have things we need to do, but I think we're pretty cohesive group and we're diligent and we are faithful to our studies and the fact that we show up on a regular basis I think is going to pay off in the long run. Big big dividend. Uh Renee your mic is cute. Did you want to say something? So I just wanted to actually I just text. So I just wanted to say thank you so much. I hope in the new year, um, with my school a little bit of my school out of the way, I can um I can join in more often. I guess mentioning earlier my school was every Wednesday night. I was taking um two drawing classes uh, in fine arts, taking two drawing classes to um hopefully help me in the future. And it's nice hearing you again, Lynn. Um hope to see you at the conference in June, and thank you so much for the both of you for uh, your consistency and your generosity. It is just amazing, just amazing what you two do. And thank you for being there. Good here, here, here. Thank you. And I want to say happy holidays to everybody, and uh, practice, practice. <laughs> practice, practice. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's hard to believe it's December. Can I say something? Sure. Yeah, I have one comment and one question. The question will be for Lynn, but the comment is uh, for Betty Edwards, she upgrades her books every uh, 10 years. Her newest book is out now. It also comes with a workbook. You can also order a DVD and a uh, packet for drawing. It's really good. And the question for Lynn is, what are we going to see this new book? I know you're not uh, feeling very good right now, but I sure would like to read your book. Oh, thank you. I have no idea. I keep uh, I keep scrapping the whole thing and starting over. And at some point, I've got to have somebody come in and just take the thing out of my hands and get it away from me and say no. I keep being unhappy with it and scrapping it and starting over. I, I shouldn't allow myself to do that. Okay. Uh, well, why don't you do what the, the other authors do? Why don't you put the book out and then add your corrections to it, and then two years later or whatever, come out with it again? Hey, so that's like Microsoft does with his programming. <laughs> right. 
I've, I've got several books like that. I've, I've bought them, and you'll have the book, and then they'll turn around and say, we've added uh, all this extra new content. We've upgraded it. You can do that. And I'll hey. buy the second book also. Hey, that's way to make good money, too, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, you get rich selling them books. Yeah. Uh, I don't care how much money you make. I just want that knowledge. <laughs> well, that's that's what I want to impart is the knowledge. I just want to, you know, every now and then I start feeling my age, and I don't want it to go by the wayside with me, go into the ground with me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, if you, but uh, that would be my suggestion, to put the book out and then go back and, and add to it and then down the road. Release it again. It, Ingo did that with with uh, one of his books. He just went to a different publisher. Well, that's true. Yeah, and uh, shoot, I you know I don't scrap them. I've got mm-hmm. shoot, twenty versions on on my computer here, and so uh, probably ought to get the twenty versions, turn them over to Linda, and have her you know mix and match. And that sounds like a plan. Yeah. That sounds real good. It sounds real good. Yeah. It's like well, it's like my artwork. I, you know. I know. She I, comes and takes it away from you and says, "That's it." That's it. Yeah. Well, I hope you start feeling better. Oh, uh, thank you. I hope you all have a good Christmas and New Year's and holidays. Yeah. You too. Yes. Everybody. Thank you. You had great sessions tonight. Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. See you next year. See you then. Good night, John Boy. Good night, Daisy May. I have got to learn the sister's name in that in that thing. Mary Ellen. <laughs> Mary Ellen. Good night, Mary Ellen. <laughs> all right. So I will have the roster up for 2014. Everybody keep their eye on uh, IRVA. We're having the 2014 conferences uh, set. There's a call for papers out. There'll be more information to come. Uh, Project Publish is something that Aesthetic Impact is doing. We've got 21 participating viewers turning in sessions on eight targets. That's wrapping up uh, December 18th, and we'll be looking at those and hopefully get some sessions out of there. It, it, I don't want to sound like I'm cherry picking, but I'm going to be sort of cherry picking because it's not a scientific study. I don't care how many people hit the target, how many people didn't hit the target, how many of the perceptions we score, how many we don't. I'm looking for some sessions that will illustrate remote viewing, what we can do, just not special unit numbers after you guys have been out teaching for all these years. And uh, I'm going to publish it. I've got copyright to all those targets, all eight of them, and or permission rather, and uh, the pe- from the photographers. And the permission slips have been signed by the participate participating viewers. And I'm hoping to put out a book um, with some illustrations and some tips from the tutorials that we put together. And that's one of my goals for 2013. So. Uh, and the whole community is just really lighting up. If you guys are part of uh, Facebook, you know, remote viewing on, group on Facebook, there's all kinds of chatter going on there. Lori Williams is just on fire with all the activity she has going on. And uh, if you queue into her website, Intuitive Specialist, there's a lot going on with her group. Um, the last issue to uh, remote or eight martinis, Daz um, has articles in there from a lot of camps. Uh, we saw two of Prue's students putting in articles. Uh, Lynn wrote an article. Ron and I wrote an article. Um, one of Ingo's articles was in there. Uh, Angela Thompson Smith had an article, which included the Nevada Remote Viewing Group. And we had Hitomi and Dick Allgaier from Hawaii, from that group, Gail with the were, God Particle. Yeah, Gail wrote one too. Gail who wrote one about analysis. Who? Uh, Gail Husick. Yes, thank you. I thought it said Dale, and I'm thinking Dale Graff. Yeah. She Sorry, wrote yes. about and, analysis. Oh, that was, if you guys, you really, really, really need to read this issue of Eight Martini, because Gail Husick is another one of, 
to down. Did she come down through Colleen and you when you would go to Canada to teach? Oh, uh, uh, she's one of my students from the very start. Okay. And is well, now she has a, got basically a professional analyst and project manager. And she has got an article in there about reverse speech that is just a, a real showstopper. So anyway, yes, I'd exactly. highly include, encourage all of you to read um, that issue. So anyway, that's all I have. And uh, I almost hate to close out 2013, but if we don't do that, we're not going to do great things in 2014. So good night, everybody. Happy holidays, and we'll see you next year. All right, and thank you, Teresa. You're welcome. Couldn't do it without you. Sure you could. Night. Love you.